Amen. So we are talking about freedom. You know what? It gets me a little bit choked up because there's so much stuff in my past that could still be holding me down if I let it. When I look to my past, there is so much in my past, so many mistakes I made, so many chains I took on, that if I let it, I could still be chained down by that. If I, if I didn't say, you know what, I'm surrendering this to God and I'm going to expect him and, and trust for him to set me free, I'd still be in chains. I'd still be enslaved. And you know what? I think that it's real easy for us to forget that fact sometimes that, that we serve a God who sets us free. And I'm not just talking about free from addiction because we heard stories a couple of weeks ago about people who got set free from, from emotional stuff, from, from addiction, from different things like that. And, uh, and, and even freedom found in forgiveness and, and we've seen all that, but there's so much that God has set us free from that, that it's every aspect of our life it, it, we find freedom in through Jesus. So this morning I want to talk about freedom. We're going to carry on this series for two more weeks. Pastor Carmen is going to conclude next week. But this morning uh, I'm going to be speaking specifically on freedom in our families. Freedom for our families, not freedom from your families. Um, I know that sometimes that seems like it's a good thing. I just got back from a trip to Boston, and I got some freedom from my family. It was great to come home, but I tell you, it was great to eat whatever I wanted to eat and to do whatever I wanted to do for a couple of days. Gentlemen, you feeling me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, that's right. What you eat in Boston stays in Boston, baby. That's what it is. But it was great. We had a great time. Got away for a few days and got to go see Paul, uh, Pastor Paul Rogers, if you guys are familiar with uh, Aaron's brother, he spoke here a few times, and, and it was great. They were hospitable, and uh, yeah, it was great times, but talking about freedom for your family, not freedom from your family this morning. I want to look to start off this entire discussion this morning. I want to look at that freedom in the family begins with some very interesting facts. Okay, so it's kind of like facing the facts, all right? Fact number one, we are all different, right? We're all different. You guys found that out, right? How many people had a kid, and all of a sudden was like, Wow. This kid is definitely not me. It's definitely, that's, that's the mother in, in him, or her, right? You try to cast the blame a little bit. Whenever, you know, gay backs up, I'll be like, Tanya, your son is acting up, right? But, you know, we're all a little bit different. You may act alike, and in the family, you may look alike, and you may even smell alike. Usually that's because you eat alike, right? But you may even smell alike. But we're all a little bit different. And because of the differences between men and women and parents and children, we actually need God's help and wisdom in kind of managing these relationships. And, and I think that it's kind of interesting. There's a guy by the name of Robert Orban, and he, he gives this quote by Winston Churchill. He says, who can ever forget Winston Churchill's immortal words? He said, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight in the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields, and we shall fight in the streets, and we shall fight on the hills. And Robert says, that sounds exactly like my family vacation. <laughs> and I hope that's not true about your family. I want to share a, a family vacation with you guys. Uh, whenever I was uh, 19 years old, we went on a family trip to Florida. So basically, we set out and we drew, drove and we flew out of Boston. So we drove all the way to Boston. So I just want to let you guys know that sometimes it's just better just to buy a ticket from your home city. You guys hearing me? Sometimes it's just better just to say, you know what, I'm going to bite the bullet and pay the extra couple hundred bucks, and I'm just going to fly. We drove for like, I don't know, I think it was like 15 or 16 hours to Boston, and it was a long day of traveling. And, and during that process, um, it was just my mom go driving, actually, and then my dad was flying in to meet us there. So during that time, my mom got sick, so she was sick, right? And you know, like, sick moms have no choice but to carry on, right? You had no choice but to keep on keeping on, right? So she was sick, and then... And uh, so we had this great experience, and we flew out of Boston, and we landed in, in uh, Tennessee, and then we transferred there. And, uh, and I just want to tell you guys that, you know, in traveling like that, in multiple flights, and that KFC is a bad idea. Okay? So I stopped, and I was, you know, I was a teenager. I said, I'm going to have a big thing at KFC. So I got this KFC, and then the next flight, you know, we were landing, and the other plane wasn't off of the runway yet. So as the plane was coming down, the other plane was leaving, so we had to pick up and keep kind of... That was the worst eight minutes of my life. The worst. You know when you get that panicky feeling and you start looking for the bag? You know what I mean? Your face is burning and on fire, and there's like sweat pouring down your face, and, and everyone around you knows you're getting sick, and they see it on you. You're as pale as a ghost. 
So I'm looking for this thing, and the plane is like doing this great big turn, and it was just this big, big mess. And then we finally land in Orlando, and um, Vanessa, who's not here this morning, she's working, she, she was, I think, 12 at the time, and she was running up and down this escalator, right? And, uh, and we are kind of like doing our thing, waiting for whatever, the, the shuttle to come get us, and she's going up and down this escalator with her shoes untied. And I said, Vanessa, you're going to get your shoelace stuck in the escalator, right? That's like every parent's worst nightmare. You see the, the things. T- so you're going to get your shoelace stuck in this escalator. And she's like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Twelve. Twelve. And no, I'm not. And then she like sticks her tongue out at me or something and keeps going up and down. And we're all kind of like, you know, checking, waiting for our bags and stuff. And all of a sudden we hear this unbelievable scream. Just like the whole airport is like, sounds like a siren going off. And uh, Vanessa's shoelace gets stuck in the escalator. And her shoe's stuck and she's trying to get it out. And her shoe's tightening and tightening and tightening and the lace is pulling. So of course, me being the big brother, I run over and I grab her shoe and I rip the lace off of it and save her life. (laughs) Right? Saved her life. And I've I've been holding that over her head ever since. Vanessa, can you watch, Gabe? I'm busy. Well, you know, there's that time I saved your life. So we finally get to Florida, and we get lost driving around trying to find the vacation home that we rented, right? And, uh, and, and Vanessa at this point is, you know, kind of pushing people's buttons. You know, she's 12 years old. She's doing her thing. And uh, she says, well, we get to the house. I'm going swimming in the pool. And it's like, you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. My mom says, no, you're not. We're going to bed. She says, no. I'm going swimming in the pool. I was like, no, we're, you're going to bed. She says, I am swimming in the pool. So my mom's driving, and she's trying to swat at her as she's driving down the road. No, you're not. You're going to bed, right? And uh, so Vanessa just wouldn't stop. She just wouldn't give it up. So my mom, my mom says to me, she goes, oh, she goes, my daughter is the devil. Okay? So this is just kind of the start of our family trip so far. And, and Vanessa's pushing the buttons, and, and I'm saving her life, and I'm being the, the golden child. And... So we get lost, and we finally get, <laughs> we finally get to the house, okay, and we've been traveling for a while, now the KFC has worked its course, and I'm hungry again. I'm a teenager, I'm hungry again. So I said, Mom, I'm walking up to the corner store. Okay, and we're from a small town. She's like, no, you are not. I was like, yeah, I am. She said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. She said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. I said, I'm 19 years old. If I want to walk up to the corner store and get something to eat, I'm going to walk up to the corner store and get something to eat. And she stood in the doorway and said, you will go out this door over my dead body. Right? So she's like doing this. And so we ended up digging through the cupboards and we found food. Right? We found a can of beans and a can of cream corn. She said, you can eat that or you can eat nothing. So we had beans and cream corn. So our family trip, you know, all these things come out when you spend that much time in that, in that close uh, of a confinement, and you realize that, you know what? We're all different. We're all different. Some of us are heroes. Some, some of us are damsels in distress. And some of us can act like devils. I don't know. So we had this great, crazy experience, but the reality is, facing the facts, that we are all different. In our families, we're all different. When we try to make somebody else us, we really push them beyond what they're capable of doing, right? I could, I could never expect Tanya to do what I do, and I would, would never expect me to be able to do what she does, because we're all different, and we, and we all act different. There's a couple of the differences. In the bathroom, a man has six items in the bathroom, on average. A toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, shaving cream, razor, bar of soap, towel, and uh, maybe some deodorant. <laughs> maybe. Well, that, that, yeah, some of us maybe. The typical woman has over 200 items in the bathroom. There's things in there I don't even know what they are. There's contraptions to like rip your eyelashes out or something. It looks like vice grips for eyelashes. I said, oh, Tani, why do you have eyelash vice grips in here? I thought you wanted to keep your eyelashes. Why are you clamping down on them? There's things that I don't understand. They have all kinds of crazy things. We have to understand that we're different. We're really, really different. Dressing up. A woman would dress up to go shopping, to water the plants, to empty the garbage, to answer the phone, to read a book, or even go to the mall. You're lucky if I dress up to put the garbage on the curb. (laughs) Of course, these are generalizations, so I don't want any any women beating me up after service. 
spending money. A man will pay $10 for a $5 item he needs. A woman will pay $5 for a $10 item she doesn't need because it's on sale. Now, that might be the opposite. I'm the one that kind of picks up things that we don't need around, and, and Tanya's the one that buys the $50 items. But Arguments. Women, arguments. We're, we're different in arguments. Women always have the last word in an argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument. Truth, right? How about under the idea of understanding? There's so many differences in the way we understand. Parents and children obviously understand things different. When dad came home, he was astonished to see his son Alex sitting on a horse writing something. What on earth are you doing there, he asks. Well, the teacher told us to write an essay on our favorite animal. That's why I'm here and that's why Susie's sitting on the cat. Right? They understand and they process things differently. The understanding is different. Little five-year-old Johnny was in the bathtub and his mom was washing his hair. She said to him, wow, your hair is growing so fast, you need a haircut again. And little Johnny said, well, maybe you should stop watering it so much. <laughs> and we see the, the, the difference in understanding. Finally, a father was trying to teach his young son the evils of alcohol. He put a worm in a glass of water and another uh, worm in a glass of whiskey. The worm in the water lived while the one in the whiskey curled up and died. All right, son, asked the father. What does that show you? Well, dad, it shows me if I drink alcohol, I won't get worms. <laughs> There's a reality in facing the facts that we are all different. We are all different. We're all different. We may look alike, act alike, smell alike, but we're all different. And we need to accept that fact. There's a, there's, a, there's a freedom in accepting somebody for who they are, right? And that freedom, we, we, we experience that freedom through Jesus who accepts us for who we are and for all our differences and for all our times that he says something and we understand it different or we misinterpret it or we don't, we don't process it properly. For all the times that, that, that we are outside of his will, for all the times that we are outside of the plan he has for our life, we're, he sees us and he accepts us and there's a certain freedom found in accepting each other for, being, for our differences. The second is, the fact we need to face is that we actually need each other as a family. Okay, I mean, and you know that extends well beyond the realm of your household to this church, but we need each other as a family. We need to be committed to each other. The Bible uses the commitment of a family as an example of how we should be in the church. We read in Romans 12, verse 10, it says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one another above yourselves. He's talking about the church, but he's using the example of a brother to, to, be, to stand in with a brother in the church, to treat them like family, to be there for them, to be devoted to them in brotherly love. The family model presents this great strength and importance. In Acts 2, verses 44 to 46, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were sharing lives. We need each other. Our family, we need each other in our family. We need to share lives. And we need to share our lives in this church. We need to be a part of each other's lives of what's going on. to share lives. I think it's so easy now to live in the same house as people and to barely talk. And you know what? I'm all about technology. I have I everything. I'm all about all of that. But there's a certain value in the traditional, let's sit down and have a meal together and talk about what's going on. Let's share in one another's lives. Let's engage in one another's lives. It's sometimes it's easier. I'll text Tanya. She'll be down one floor and I'm up on the floor and I'll text her something. It's easy to get caught in that loop, right? But it's really vitally important as a family unit that we share in each other's lives. We need each other. We need to learn from each other. And as a church, we need each other. We need to learn from each other. By sharing your lives, it literally means, the, the, the term they use is kionia, which means sharing. It sounds like a family to me. It sounds like you go sit down at a restaurant, and you say, we'll get the family meal. They bring out a big tray and everybody shares off of it, Right? There's a certain value in that. And it's the realization that we need each other. We need to stand together. We need to, to stand in solidarity together as a church. The early church needed it because 
society was so hostile against it. And if you live in our world today, things aren't much different. And we need to stand together as a church family, support one another, because we need each other. You might think, I don't need anything from people here. You just don't realize it yet, but you do. I might think, well, I'm the pastor. What do I need from people? I need people every day in my life to be praying for me, to be pouring into my life, to be investing in me, to be encouraging me. Because you know what? You think it's easy? You have friends, you have, you have loved ones, you have people that let you down. Well, guess what? You need some people to kind of pick up the slack and pick you up. And we need each other. I need you. I hope, hopefully, some of you guys need me, maybe. Even if it's, even if it's just to lay a beating down on one of your teenagers. If you, uh, hopefully, you need me. And we need each other, and we need to stand together in a society that's not always standing and encouraging us. So we need each other. The, the, the other fact we need to face is we need to love each other. This is something we need to do, and it's something that we need to receive. The Bible talks about love in, in many times, and, and, and the, the idea is it's not, it's a covenant, not a contract. Okay, and in our relationships, in our, in our, in our families, it's a covenant, not a, tr- a contract. It's to be loved and, and be loved. There's a quote by a guy by the name of Balswick. He says this, the logical be- beginning point of any family relationship is a covenant commitment, which has unconditional love at its core. Out of the security provided by this covenant, love develops grace. And in the atmosphere of grace, family members have the freedom to empower each other. And empowering leads to possibility of intimacy, to get to know one another on a whole new level. We need to love each other. What is a covenant? A covenant is an unconditional commitment which is demonstrated supremely by God in the role of parent, of the parent. Gabe will never be able to repay me back for what I've done for him. I don't look for him to. I don't require him to pay me back. I'll never be able to pay my mom back and my family back for what they've done for me. I, I, I don't, they don't require me to. That's kind of the difference between a covenant and a contract. The second mention of covenant in the Bible is mentioned in Genesis 7, verse 7. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and between, between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God and for you to be the descend- for, to be God and to, your, to you and your descendants after you. A strong and healthy family must be based on a covenant, not a contract. The contract says, if you do this, then I will do that and can be broken. A covenant is unconditional and looks for nothing in return. In my marriage with Tawny, it hasn't always been fun or easy. We've had some tough times, but we made a promise to one another. And divorce is just not an option. It's not an option for us. As fed up as she may get of me at times, the worst I'm going to get is a night on the couch, Maybe. Maybe. I got a little bit of a silver tongue, so sometimes I work my way back in there. (laughs) It's not an option. A contract says, let's renegotiate. I'll get the TV in the basement and the man cave. You can have the kitchen and the laundry room. Sound like a deal? (laughs) There's like a... Covenant says, let's make this work no matter what. I love you and I'm willing to do anything to make it work. And as a family, we need to say that to our family. And as a church, we need to say that to one another. Even when there's differences, even when things get tough, I love you, no matter what, let's make this work. It can't be broken because it's based on something that's unconditional. The conditions can change. And let, let me tell you that in this church, things have been going pretty good, but things can change. Stuff can get tough. But I want to let you know that if we are in a covenant with one another and with God, there is no out. Covenant that they talk about is not only between husband and wife, it's also between children too. As parents must make the commitment to unconditionally love their children and the same is true with our relationships with one another in the church. See, on Facebook, you may be able to unfriend somebody that you have issues with, but nothing will get resolved. If you're truly committed, can you unfamily somebody? You can't do that. You can't unfamily somebody, but yet sometimes in the church we think we could do that. We can unfamily people in the church click on on friend or unfollow or on family. We can't do that. So you can tweet that. I don't even know this. I I barely tweet. I'm still trying to figure that out. 
So just kind of recap, you know, there's, there's a certain freedom in just initially facing the facts that we are different and we need to accept that. We need each other and we need to love each other. Some basic principles in the home are so important and they're also used in the house of the Lord. I want to read a scripture for you if you guys want to open up to Psalms 127 this morning. We move on to talk about the foundation of freedom. Psalms 127. Talking about the foundation of freedom is faith. We're starting off, it says, Of Solomon, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, they, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but speak with their enemies at the gate. If we want to have a strong and healthy family, the Lord must be the one who builds our home. The Lord must be the one who builds our home. The industry of the builder, the vigilance of the watchman are all in vain without God's cooperation. He needs to be part of the process. So if, you've, if you've, you're here this morning, you say, you know what, I feel like you know, there's some chains in my home. I feel like I'm lacking freedom in my own house, in my family. Can I tell you this morning that if your foundation is not faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never find that freedom. You may find moments of peace. You may find find times that, that are good, but unless you're building your foundation for your home on Christ Jesus, I'm gonna tell you that you will never find true freedom. There's nothing else in this world that can give us the freedom that we need. And unless the Lord builds the house, we're just kind of laboring in vain. We're just going through the motions. We need God's cooperation. House building and city guarding are examples of ordinary human undertakings. Without the blessing of him who has promised to build the house of Israel, and he was the watchman for his people, the most strenuous efforts of the leaders and the community can avail to nothing. I deal with teenagers every week in our youth program that come from, from homes where Christ isn't the foundation. And it's pitiful. It is a challenge, and it is heartbreaking because they don't have that, that foundation. We're trying to build something up, and then they come here for three hours a week and we try to build an entire faith for them, and they go back to, to a home that lacks a foundation. Or they go back to a home that has, that has a corrupt foundation. Jesus needs to be the foundation of our home. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis I want to share with you guys this morning. It says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. You knew those jobs needed doing, and so you were not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking down the house in a way that hurts and, and, and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation that he is building, quite, the explanation is he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting up an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were building your life into a decent cottage, but he is building a palace and he intends to come in and live in it himself. I think at times we think that we can hold it all together and we can do it, but without, without God, without the chief architect in our life, we are doing this in vain. We may set our plans and think that that's good enough, but God's plans are better than our plans, and his ways are better than our ways, and the foundation of our, of our house and our life is only found whenever we lay it according to his plans, and in his, and faith in him, we find freedom. The most strenuous efforts of leaders of the community can avail to nothing without Jesus. C.S. Lewis says it so beautifully. He's building a palace. He has plans to build a palace. So let's not settle for a, me a measly little cottage. God has something big planned when we put our faith in him and we set his, his, him as a chief cornerstone of our lives. 
and in our families. We need to put our faith in Christ. He has a plan, he has a design, and he's the one who knows what he's doing. If anybody's ever worked on a project with me, I am strong as a bull, but I have very little direction. Right? I need God to give me a plan on what I'm doing. I will work myself to the bone, but I need God to design and set my path. I think many of us are the same way. We have our strengths, we have our weaknesses, but we need Jesus to set out for us what to do. And he will see our weaknesses and he will make us strong in those areas. We need to put our faith in Christ. Freedom in the one, one person in this world who has the ability to actually set us free. He has a plan, a design, and a vision, and it's greater than ours. So what is foundational to your family? Every family is built on something. I see a lot of, of teens and families that are, you know, they're built on sports. I'm going to teach my kid all this stuff through sports. And that's, you know, partially, that's a good thing. You know, they're built on social times, quality, family time, entertainment. All those things, they can build their family on that, but it's not enough. Some parents say, well, I'll go to work and every night I'm going to come home and spend two or three hours with my kid. That is not enough. I don't have the ability to lead and develop Gabe into the man that God's called him to be on my own. Because he'll never have an example even close enough to who God's called him to be through my life alone. At times, we're all foolish builders, myself included. We build upon four poor foundations. And you know what? We may be able to dodge some issues and, and patch up, do a patch job for some short time, but if God is not what you build your family life upon, a wind will eventually come, a storm will eventually come, a trial will eventually come, and knock everything down. Faith in Jesus Christ needs to be the foundation on what, upon everything that we build. It's foundational. You want freedom in your home from addiction, hurt, abuse, pain, anger? Build your home, your family, upon a stronger foundation than what you're capable of providing. Amen. We lived in St. John for a number of years before we moved to Halifax, to, to the HRM. And if you guys, I don't know if you've heard the story before, but we lived in a mobile home when we were in St. John. Not one of those really nice ones. One of those really not nice ones. One of those, like, 11 feet wide ones. And, uh, you know, in the wintertime, there would be frost come inside the walls on the inside, right? And it's, I'm just glad that, uh, that Frozen wasn't out yet, because we could have sang, do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> this frost would come up on the inside of the walls in the winter, and, and the only thing that kept me was this great big warm uh, down comforter that I had. So we lived in this, in this home, and, and, and there was actually holes in the floors, right? When you'd walk into our front door, the floor was bouncy, like a trampoline. Anybody ever have a floor like that in your house? That's, that's, it's kind of rough, right? You kind of stand on it, it's like squishy and bouncy. So we had to cut a great big section of the floor out and replace it. And, and, uh, and you know, it had rotten walls. Mold got all up inside the walls, and, and there's this black mold everywhere in the trailer, and so our bouncy entrance floor, and, and, and uh, I, we didn't have a lot of money then, so I didn't turn the heat on really high, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway, because it would just be heating up outside anyway. There was like, you know, quarter-inch gaps in the windows. It was just, it was bad. So th th we're living in this, this kind of like really rough trailer, and there's like holes, and, and the pipes froze one time. Anybody ever have your pipes freeze at your house? That's just no fun, right? That's just no fun. They did some construction behind where we lived in this trailer, and they, they blew out the side of a mountain to build a Costco. And uh, because of that, all the field mice lost their homes, so they found a new home. <laughs> so I had somebody to keep me warm. <laughs> they, found, they found a new home, and, and I want to tell you guys something this morning. When we're talking about building our homes for Christ, patchwork doesn't work. I want to say that again, patchwork doesn't work. Sometimes we need to renovate from the ground up. Sometimes we need to tear that, that garbage heap down and we need to build something new because you can only patch up so much and another problem is going to come up. So you patch that and then another problem is going to come up and you patch that and you patch that and you patch that. Patchwork doesn't work. Sometimes you need to just abandon our plans altogether and let's just go with what God has. 
Let's just go with what God has. Let's just put our trust in God. Let's just see his plans. Patchwork doesn't work. There's a freedom found when we make Christ our foundation. There's a freedom found in forgiveness as well in the family. Tony was driving home the other night, and uh, it was after one of those snowstorms, anybody ever have a chunk of ice stuck in your wheel? Right, so she was driving. I drove home, and I couldn't figure out what wheel it was, and I had to get home and, so she can get to work, and it was real quick. I went out, and I hammered at some of the wheels, and I said, listen, Tony, there's a chunk of ice in there. It doesn't really do anything until you go over, like, 70, 80, then it starts to shake, right? So she's like, okay, no problem. I said, take your time in, into work and back, and... I'll try to figure out what wheel it's in tomorrow and we'll, we'll deal with it. So she's driving home and I get a phone call. She gets off at about 10.30. I get a phone call about 10.40 and she's like, I'm so mad right now. I was like, I was on the couch, I was like, had chip crumbs all over me. And I'm, I'm like, what? I'm just so angry right now. I'm like, why? She goes, the car is shaking so bad. The seat beside me is shaking. I said, well, how fast are you going? She's like, 95? I said, well, just slow down. She's like, I can't slow down. I said, why can't you slow down? She said, I just can't. I was like, yeah, just less gas. Maybe mix a little bit of brake in there. You'll slow down. She said, I can't slow down. Some guy was tailgating me, and now I'm tailgating him back to teach him a lesson. I can't slow down. I was thinking she had me worried. I was thinking the brakes weren't working or something, but I can't slow down. I want to talk about forgiveness for a few minutes. There's a freedom found and strengthened in our lives when we can learn to forgive one another in our homes as well as in our church. We're under grace, not law, to forgive and be forgiven. Balswick says family relationships as designed by God are meant to be lived out in an atmosphere of grace and not law. We see this principle in the word, and it says, and, to be, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, just as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. In a family relationship based on law, perfection will be demanded of each other. Rules and regulations will be rigidly set up to govern relationships. This pressure adds to guilt to, fail, adds to, guilt to failure, and, and is inevitable in, in that situation. You know, you, you get this standard that if you break this and you mess up, there's a hammer coming down on you. Grace doesn't mean that you don't have rules in your family, but rather that you give your spouse and your children the freedom to fail and to walk in forgiveness just as you walk in forgiveness. See, in our family, Tanya and Gabe mess up lots. <laughs> but so do I. If it wasn't for grace, we'd be very miserable instead of loving one another. And if it wasn't for grace in our church, if we can't, if we can't find our faith and our freedom founded upon Christ and we can't learn to forgive one another, we're just slapping chain after chain on us. There's a freedom found in forgiveness. Even whenever you're slighted, even when you're wronged, even when somebody does something to hurt you, even if they do it intentionally, even if they do it with malice, there's a freedom in forgiving them for that Amen. and walking in that freedom. So we have freedom for the family this morning. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come on back. And uh, we look at freedom is found in facing these facts that we're different, we need each other, we need to love each other. Basic foundation of it is faith. Nothing else can set us free. Everything else will fail. We need Jesus. And freedom is strengthened in forgiveness. The freedom to move forward, get over it, forgive. See, we're called to walk in freedom. We're called to live like the free. We're called to act like the free in our homes. We're called to act like we're free in our churches and in our worship time. We're called to act like we're free in our workplaces and in our schools. We're called to act like there's, there's something different than the rest of the world. 
I think it's time that we begin to act like free people. And you know what? If we can't have it in our churches, we won't have it in our homes. If we can't have it in our homes and our churches, we won't have it in our workplaces. We need to act like we're free. A guy by the name of Steve Brown, he wrote a book called The Scandalous Freedom. He says this, the good news is that Christ frees us from the need to obnoxiously focus on our goodness, our commitment, and our correctness. Religious, religious has made us obsessive about almost beyond endurance. But Jesus invites us to dance. He invites us to dance. And we sometimes turn that into a march of soldiers always checking to see if we're doing everything right, always checking to see that we're stepping in line with one another. We know that dancing would be so much more fun, but we believe we must go through hell to get to heaven so we keep on marching. I want to say that again. We believe that we must go through hell to get to heaven so we keep on marching. Finding freedom doesn't mean a book of rules. Finding freedom means what God spoke over our life and applying it to our heart and into our families. I want to encourage you guys to stand this morning. Let's not do a march this morning. Let's not raise a hand out of out of religious action. Let's not sing a song because it's what we do at this point in our service. Let's do it because God's called us to dance in freedom. Let's do it because we genuinely in our heart acknowledge that Christ has set us free and the ones who are set free are free indeed. Let's do it because we can acknowledge as a church that, that, that we can have freedom in our hearts and in here and we can encourage one another to walk in freedom and accept one another and worship together and accept what God has spoken into our lives that we can have freedom out there. Nobody wants to march in the army but deep down everybody wants to dance. You might think, you know, I don't dance. I don't dance. It's a part of your heart that's calling you to just celebrate God's freedom. Yes. Heavenly Father, God, we're just grateful that we can gather here. God, we're grateful, God, that you've just, God, not held us to our failures. We're grateful that you've given us a foundation, a chief cornerstone that we can set our life on. God, we're grateful that our hearts and our lives can have the freedom to dance before you. Help us live it in our workplaces. Help us live it in our homes and in our churches.